Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Robin Lipsky, and I have the honor of being both the Executive Director of the Ninth Circuit Historical Society and also a board member of the Northern District Court Historical Society. And on behalf of both of our societies, it's my pleasure to welcome you here today. I'll be back later and talk to you more about our two societies. But in the meantime, I'd just like to turn the program over to my esteemed colleague on the Northern District Court Board, Judge William Alsop, who will introduce Judge McCune. Thank you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm Judge Alsup on the Northern District and it's uh, my pleasure to kick us off here with a, a wonderful program. It's a historic program because uh, this is our first ever Zoom program. That's number one. And secondly, it's our largest ever attendance. Almost 500, 500 almost have signed up for today's program. And that's no doubt because of the stellar story that you're about to hear, as well as the stellar storyteller that you're about to hear. Judge Margaret McEwen has written a, a book about Justice Douglas called Citizen Justice, the Environmental Legacy of Justice William O. Douglas. It will be published uh, in, in about one year, probably less than one year, by the Potomac Press. Now, the judge needs no introduction, but she deserves one, at least a short one, so I'm privileged to do that. She is a Westerner from Washington State, and therein lies the, the origin of her admiration for Justice Douglas, who was also from Washington State. The judge is also a mountaineer, close to my heart, a mountaineer. And she, in fact, was on the first expedi American expedition to Tibet. She graduated from Georgetown Law School in 1875. She practiced law in Seattle and um, Washington, D.C. She was appointed by Judge by President Clinton in 1998 to the circuit court in our circuit to the Court of Appeals. Judge McEwen is extremely active in, uh, in, in addition to her normal caseload in ABA and judicial uh, conference matters. I'll give you just two examples. She is on the ABA committee for the 19th Amendment and the Chief Justice of the United States has appointed her to the National Workplace Conduct Working Group. I, many other things in that category I could give you, but let's, we'll move on. You will have the chance through using the chat feature to ask questions. And near the end, Robin Lipsky will select a few of those questions and propound those to the judge. All of these, of course, about Justice Douglas. So you will have that opportunity if you would like to do that. I have one last thing to do. I have to advise you about MCLE. And those of you who registered for California MCLE, please pay attention. During the program, a nu numeric verification code will appear in the chat box. You must record that code in order to receive MCLE credit, as this is a requirement for California CLE. So check the little box the chat box and record that number. And then after the event, you will need to visit njchs.org and uh, the website and complete the verification form. And that will then, with, and there's, that's where you use the numeric code and that will then uh, satisfy your requirements. And, and it's, it's easy to do, but you just gotta remember to, to look at your chat box to get that number. And so with that, it's my very great pleasure to introduce my colleague, uh, Margaret McEwen, and her, her topic on Justice William O. Douglas. Thank you. <laughs> 
Hello, and thank you to Judge Alsup for the introduction and also for the two historical societies for hosting this event. I, of course, wish I could be there with all of you in person, uh, but uh, because we are talking about history and because it's historic that we are doing this virtually, I cannot be. So instead, I hope I can take you on a journey from your living room, your office, or elsewhere. We know that legal scholarship often focuses on the judicial role of the Supreme Court. And here, I think there's a larger story to be told about the justices as public figures. The subject of today's story is William O. Douglas. He definitely was larger than life and a very, very public justice. So it's the tale of why many trees are still standing and the backstory of him as a citizen justice. He was a controversial justice. He's often remembered for his four wives, his impeachment inquiry, which was unsuccessful. And he also, even today, is the longest serving justice, 1939 to 1975, 36 plus years. We're all familiar that he authored landmark decisions in privacy, criminal justice, but I think perhaps the most enduring legacy was what he did for the environment. He was an unusual justice, to be sure. He pushed, pushed the envelope personally, ethically, and judicially. So this evening, I'm going to explore that through three different lenses. His role in dissenting on the road, dissenting on the corridors of power, and then also dissenting on the court. So the story begins not in uh, Washington, D.C., but in Wyoming. And here you can see a slide, I hope, of, yeah, here you can see a slide of the Murray Ranch in the winter. I'm a Wyoming native, and I was snowshoeing through Grand Teton National Park when I came upon this homestead and this cabin, and I didn't know what it was, and I'm quite familiar with that area. So I was contemplating whether I could sit on the porch or not when somebody came out and I said, where am I? And he said, oh, you're at the Murray Ranch. And I said, oh yeah, I know that, John Muir. And he said, no, no, Murray, not Muir. And I said, oh, okay. And that really was how I began my love affair with the Murrays and the Murray Ranch. From 1945 until the early 60s, Olas Murray was the director of the Wilderness Society, and its headquarters was here at the Murray Ranch. It was also called Conservation's Home. Now, his, he was a world-famous wildlife biologist. His wife was also a naturalist and an author, and she became known as the grandmother of conservation. She died at 101 years old. So I was going through the archives when I discovered a letter from Justice Douglas to the Park Service. And he suggested that the Murray Ranch become a national historic park and that it be a place that would be like a sanctuary. So it came to pass that in 1998, the entire ranch became a national historic district. And you can now see that it's part of the Teton Science School. But the question kept nagging me, what was this relationship between these humble conservationists out in Wyoming and this very famous justice, William O. Douglas? So I learned that they're all Westerners, of course. They were all connected to the land and they were all committed to conservation advocacy. So I began some research on a lark. Um, and then it turned into a passion and finally now has turned into a book. It's taken me to Douglas's archives at the Library of Congress, which are an amazing treasure trove. He was a total pack rat and a great correspondent, so everything is preserved. I've also benefited from the Wilderness Society archives in Denver, from archives at the University of Wyoming, George Washington University, Berkeley, um, and also the LBJ Library, among many others. And along the way, I've been able to continue my friendship with Judge Alsop, about whom you'll hear later, and many other Douglas clerks. Along with Kathy Douglas, I learned about the Pinwads, 
the Pacific Northwest William O. Douglas Society. And I met many fascinating people along the way, like Charlie Reich, who was the author of Greening of America, and also a very good friend of Douglas. But I discovered that there was a much bigger story here than Douglas as a justice. And that is one that he became a leader post-World War II of the conservation movement. So this lecture gives me a gift, and that's the chance to share the story with you. Let me first set a background stage. Who was William O. Douglas? Well, of course, we all know he was an outdoors person. He's been called many things, Wild Bill, which of course was both a reference to his opinions, but also the fact that he's Wilderness Bill. He was independent and unpredictable and he had cowboy mannerisms. People in Washington sometimes wondered when he wore one of his other hats, the big kind of five gallon cowboy hat, whether it was all hat and no cattle. But I can assure you, he was a true Westerner. He was brought up in Yakima, Washington by a single mother. And as a child, he was very sickly, punctuated by ill health and hence this mystique of his childhood polio really dominated his life. He later took refuge in hiking and his love of the mountains. And throughout life, in his writings and his court opinions, he connected spirituality and nature. His father, in fact, was a preacher. He then went off to Whitman College. He rode the rails to Columbia Law School and went east. He wrote a book called Go East, Young Man. And then he had the beginning of his meteoric rise. He was a star at Columbia. But I find one of the most interesting things is that he missed the brass ring of law school and that was the Supreme Court clerkship. Somebody else got the clerkship that year. But amazingly, just 14 years later, he was on the Supreme Court as a member of the court. Before he did that, uh, he worked at the Cravath Law Firm. He didn't much like it. He thought there was a lot of drudgery. So he briefly thought about going back to Washington and practice law. And he interviewed at uh, the Perkins Law Firm, my old law firm in Washington State. They offered him a job for $600. He compared that to Cravath at $5,000. And you can imagine what he did. He went back to New York. So some things never changed. But later he became a law professor at both Columbia and then Yale. Now, when he was a law professor, one thing that bothered him a lot was that the law school always posed questions but never answered them. So he tried a very different approach, legal realism. And that was making the law more relevant to life. And you then begin to see that later in his judicial opinions. So eventually, you know, amazingly, he was a corporate uh, professor in the corporate law area. He left to go to the SEC to head up a study, a bankruptcy related study. And then very quickly, under the tutelage of Joseph Kennedy, he became a member of the commission. And two years later, he actually became the chair of the Securities and Exchange Commission. He was there only two years before he went on to the US Supreme Court. So 1939, Roosevelt nominated him. He was only 40 years old and he replaced Justice Brandeis. Actually, Roosevelt had wanted a Westerner for political reasons. So Douglas did everything he could to shore up the fact that he was a Westerner, even though he'd been East by then the majority of his life. And at one point, Roosevelt called him to the White House and Douglas was really in despair. He thought he was gonna be named as chair of the Federal Communications Commission. But instead, the president said, no, I'm gonna offer you a job that is something like being in jail. And so he nominated him to the US Supreme Court. Two days later, he was confirmed and his hearing lasted five minutes. So it was quite a different era. Now, at heart, Douglas was a very political animal. In Washington, he thrived. He played poker with the president. He hobnobbed with ambassadors. He went to cocktail parties. Um, and so he was really part of that social and political fabric of Washington, DC. Uh, 
his first decade on the bench, he was really a political star. But interestingly, from the time he joined the bench until into the 50s, he was considered time and again as a possible presidential and vice presidential candidate. He kept saying, no, politics are perishable. I want to stay with the court. But he was always finagling for this possible position. And finally, he was offered the vice presidency from Truman. He turned it down and here's what he said. Why be number two to a number two? So by then, he basically knew he would be staying with the court. So his attachment to the court grew firmer as his political prospects changed. But he had a near fatal horse accident near Mount Rainier in 1949. He broke 23 ribs. He slid off the back of the horse and then the horse tumbled down and crushed him basically. By then he'd been on the court for a decade. He was a bit bored and his marriage to his childhood sweetheart was on the rocks. So once his political ambitions had been trimmed, by the early 1950s, it seemed he was there to stay on the Supreme Court. So as he was recovering, he finished his book of Men and Mountains, an homage to the mountains and the wilderness. And it was around this time that he became an unapologetic environmental activist. Now his view about himself, both as a citizen and a justice, can be traced to a case in his first term, 1939, the case of O'Malley versus Woodruff. Here's what the case was about. Did a federal judge have to pay income tax or would that be contrary to the constitutional provision about federal judges' compensation not being diminished during their time in office. Well, the court quickly axed the judge's claim and he, they noted that judges are also citizens. So I agree with the decision. Of course, um, we wish the result might've been otherwise, but Douglas joined the majority. And that's when he had this notion that he was a citizen justice. So here's what he said to Eric Severide. He said, I made a little entry into the docket sheet and I said to myself, young man, you've just voted yourself first class citizenship. He said he decided if he had to pay taxes like everybody else, then he could be a citizen. And that meant he could do anything a citizen can do unless it directly interfered with the work of the court. Now, during his time on the court, he had two abiding themes that we'll explore. One, he believed that wilderness spaces provide solitude, strength, and spirituality. And that those are forces larger than the individual. And second, he believed the Constitution was written and intended to keep the government off the backs of the people and to protect minority views. So we see that both of those themes in his work on the court and his conservation work. So consider now dissenting on the road. That's what defined him as a national leader in the post-war conservation movement. He followed in the tradition of several heroes, Thoreau, John Muir, and Teddy Roosevelt. So I'm gonna chronicle a couple of his hikes and I want you to imagine that there's a different justice heading the hike. Can you imagine that today? So the first hike, big hike he did was on the CNO Canal. And he always, he kept a very detailed calendar at work. And then when he went on hikes, he kept a little black notebook about every one of his hikes, which is really a wonderful thing to be able to go and see those original notebooks in the Library of Congress. The calendar entry for March 20, 1954, deceivingly simple. It said hike, that's all. But it would change his life and his trajectory. So in the 50s, National Park Service decided that they wanted to construct a byway, some people would say highway, along the CNO Canal near Washington. The Washington Post editorial board was a huge advocate for the plan. 
And although posterity has linked Douglas to the environmental and conservation causes, this was really the first spark. So he then wrote an editorial to the Washington Post. Keep in mind now he's a justice. He was really alarmed about the Post position. And he then described what the, Washington, what the CNO Canal meant. He also said, I wish the man who wrote your editorial would come take time off and come with me. And so indeed, these are classic Douglas incantations. He said, if he did, he would return a new man and he would keep this sanctuary untouched. So the hike happened and here we have him on the CNO Canal. 37 people started out, only nine finished, and one of those was Olas Muri. They completed the 189 mile hike. And later he was so successful, he persuaded the post to change its position. So following the hike, he contacted the Secretary of Interior to lobby him about keeping the highway away. They formed a nonprofit organization, Douglas became the president, and then he continued lobbying until the CNO Canal was protected, ultimately in 1971. He continued his Sunday hikes on the canal, virtually every Sunday, often taking the law clerks. And if you go to Georgetown now, which is the beginning of the canal, you'll see a bust of William O. Douglas. So I wanna turn then to his second pathbreaking hike, and that's to Alaska. It's called the Sheenjack Expedition. He then, um, having become fast friends with the Murrays, they talked always of a trip to Alaska, and that's where Olas and Marty had spent their honeymoon on a dog sled. So this expedition took on basically an important meaning, both politically and also scientifically. The Murrays had grave concerns about oil drilling in Alaska. And they weren't celebrity collectors, but they surely recognized what Doug Douglas could do for them. So on this particular hike, Douglas took his second wife, Mercedes, and he joined the expedition for a week. Marty Murray kept saying, Justice Douglas this, Justice Douglas that, and he finally said, stop, just call me Bill. So that's what he became. Following the trip, Douglas and the Murrays began the campaign for Alaska, and they moved really from adventurism to evangelism. Douglas worked the DC angles, and the Murrays worked the angles in Alaska. Douglas then wrote a chapter on the Arctic Range and his trip and the importance of the Arctic Range. He talked about it as a place that should remain roadless and primitive where ancient ecological balances are maintained. So then politics intervened and the, the wildlife refuge was protected, but not permanently uh, by President Eisenhower. And then it became a big political fight. Um, ultimately, President Carter designated it uh, as a national monument, but still nothing permanent. And that's where I was fortunate to enter the scene. I had a front row seat in the battle as I was special assistant and White House fellow to Secretary of Interior, Cecil Andrus, who was the chief negotiator for trying to broker a deal. He was a little unpopular in Alaska. When we went up there, we saw stickers that said, lock up Andrus, not Alaska. And right months before the legislation passed, he told me to start working on implementation. And I said to him, but we don't even have a bill. We don't even have a preserved Alaska. And he said, but it will pass. And he was right. There was a rump session of Congress. He knocked heads together on all sides and they came out with a compromise, which was the Alaska National Interest Land Conservation Act. Now, Douglas was important. Um, and having been to the Sheen Jack, it wasn't his first time to Alaska. One of the government scientists put it like this. He said, that goofy bird from the Supreme Court had a name that was sterling and magic in Washington, DC. 
Douglas was a formidable advocate, and I like what Douglas Brinkley wrote about him. He said, for a CEO, dealing with Douglas on environmental protection had all the appeal of shaving with a blowtorch. So leaving Alaska, and now we're going down to the lower 48 and coming to the Olympic Beach, automobiles intervened again, and there was a proposal to put a highway across really the last unspoiled stretch of beach in the lower 48 in the Olympic National Park. So with the backing of the Wilderness Society and outdoor advocates, Douglas organized a protest hike. He called the beach a place of haunting beauty and solitude. You're starting to get the picture of his language. At the end of the hike, and it was very controversial, he met up with the Automobile Club of Washington and they had big signs that said, bird watcher, go home. He chronicled the hike and the fight in one of his books, but as always, he reached across the aisle, so to speak, and shook hands with the opponents and hoped that he could bring them along. He recognized the power that he wielded and he also recognized the imprimatur of his office. Now, these three hikes I've talked about, Descenting on the Road, are just a mere sampling of his many hikes. He had kind of a signature approach. He focused on a threatened area, leveraged local and national support. He teamed up with groups like the Wilderness Society and the Sierra Club. And then he would lead a high profile hike. And after that, there would be a nonprofit organization. He would usually be the chair of that and then they would continue the campaign until there was success. So again, he was a very unusual justice. So let me turn then to dissenting in the corridors of power. This is a different kind of advocacy. And to me, what was most remarkable was his extensive lobbying and correspondence that he carried out on behalf of projects all over the country. He was, without doubt, a one-man lobby shop for the environment. He called and wrote presidents, senators, members of Congress, Secretary of the Interior, Secretary of Agriculture, and other heads of federal agencies. And so you can see that in his archives, letter after letter um, are sent out to these agencies. And that to me was probably the biggest surprise of my exploration and certainly one that raises considerable questions of judicial ethics. Now, if he had a business card, so he didn't have this business card, I created this business card, but basically um, it says what he was doing. He was having a dual role as associate justice and supreme conservation advocate. And his efforts were really incredibly diverse geographically but he had a real passion for the West. So he might have a logging project in Oregon he wants to stop, uh, a copper mine atop a mountain in Washington state, a national park in Maine, a dam, Bureau of Land Management fencing in Wyoming, a gorge in Kentucky, a river in Arkansas, a pond in New Jersey. He was a supreme advocate all over the United States. Now, he wasn't shy in his views. You would probably call him blunt. And one of the things he loved to do was excoriate bureaucrats. That was his name for federal employees. So he had what he called the public enemies list. He said it was hard to pick out number one because many of them are notorious despoilers. But he did in fact pick out number one, the Army Corps of Engineers the agency responsible for dam building. But he also named the Tennessee Valley Authority, the National Park Service, the Forest Service, the Public Roads Administration. And interestingly, at one time, when he was a kid, his childhood hero was Gifford Pinchot, the first head of the Forest Service. And he used to say, maybe I'll grow up to be like Gifford Pinchot and work for the Forest Service. Well, the truth was he was usually working against the Forest Service. But let me give you another example where he was working against the Army Corps of Engineers, and that was in the Red River Gorge. Now, the 
Sierra Club invited him down to the Red River Gorge, which is a gorgeous area. And there were several hundred demonstrators. The story was actually covered by a reporter whose name we now know, a TV journalist called Diane Sawyer, who worked as a local stringer. The organizer said they wanted national attention and they weren't sure if they hadn't had Justice Douglas, if they would have been able to stop the dam. Now he was accompanied on this hike by his fourth wife, Kathy, who was just 23 when he married her and he was 67. That scandalized the social scene in Washington, DC, but it didn't scandalize the hikers. She went on to law school and she became an accomplished environmental lawyer and philanthropist. When he got home from the hike, of course, one of the things he always did was to scan the newspapers. And one of the wire stories uh, said that he was driven out of Kentucky by armed men who didn't want a senile judge telling them how to run their affairs. Well, that wasn't exactly true, but the truth was he wasted no time in promoting his cause. He immediately uh, sent off a letter to President Johnson, and he suggested Johnson hold things up and get a report. And as we know, a report is always a stalling mechanism. Then he also got in touch with an LBJ aide and the Secretary of Interior, Stuart Udall. Later, he would in effect dump on Johnson saying that Johnson was never as good of an environmentalist as Johnson perceived himself. The way Douglas did this was to cultivate friends in high places, whether they were cabinet secretaries or senators. And he was especially close to Interior Secretary Udall. He had an eight year partnership with Udall. One example related to a case before the court on a hydroelectric dam on the Snake River in Idaho. In fact, my opening cover slide is a painting by Thomas uh, Moran of that particular area. So conservationists have been trying for years to fight this dam, including the Sierra Club. And then it went to the Supreme Court. At that point, Udall intervened on behalf of the Department of the Interior. And in the first time ever where a dam like this had been approved, the court sent it back for further study. In his opinion, he showed his intimate knowledge of ecology and salmon and steelhead, and basically said, sometimes you might need to stop improvement or development in the name of conservation. And then Udall quickly sent him this note that talked about his opinion, which he read last night. That's uh, Udall's spelling of it. And he said, congratulations. So there you can see this amazing intersection of the Sierra Club, his friend, and in this case, party to the case, Udall, and the court's opinion. Finally, I wanna mention Douglas's writings, which were key in his plank of public advocacy. He wrote more than 50 books, hundreds of articles, Ladies Home Journal. His quote that I showed you earlier about the public enemy number one was in Playboy. He actually wrote three or four articles for Playboy. And when he was attacked, he said, well, that's what young men read. And he wanted to reach out. But he also wrote for women, the Ladies Home Journal, Look, Red Book, Saturday Evening Post, National Geographic, and even the National Enquirer. So his books, some of them are very dark and dire about the environmental situation. And he even proposed a wilderness bill of rights. So what he did was to invoke his political mantle as a Supreme Court justice to reach the highest levels of power. And then of course, he dissented in the Supreme Court. Now, when he was a child, Douglas craved approbation and he wanted to fit in. But by the time he got to the court, and certainly as he had been on the court for a while, he became very sure of himself and he developed a very significant confidence. Sometimes he was too sure of himself. When he retired in 1975, he'd written the dissent in 486 cases. And just to give you a benchmark, in his 30 years on the court, Justice Scalia 
uh, dissented only 254 times. In a whopping 40% of the cases where Douglas dissented, he was the sole dissenter. He had 4,100 plus opinions under his belt that he participated in and no other justice has reached that statistical record. He was also an incredible worker and his work ethic was legendary. It didn't endear him to his um, brethren because he said you could do the work in three or four days. And so sometimes even before the court was done with its sessions, he would take off to his cabin in Goose Prairie. And here you see his cabin in Goose Prairie. Um, and there are a lot of great stories about lawyers trooping to Goose Prairie and Douglas leaving a decision under a rock down the trail. When I graduated uh, from law school and after he had died, a group of lawyers in Seattle said, let's buy the cabin and make it an historic landmark. And there were only two problems with that. One, we didn't have any money. Two, it wasn't for sale. But in an amazing full circle, one of my former partners is now the owner of that cabin at Goose Prairie. So one thing Douglas did on this court is he would stake out a position and he would stick to it. So rather than jawboning or trying to get the other justices to join him, he just didn't see the point. He said, I haven't been much of a proselytizer on the court. His theory was that he had only one soul to save, and that was his own. Now, in reading biographers and legal scholars, many of them are not particularly complimentary of his writing. They said he wrote too quickly and lacked legal scholarship. But one thing they overlook is that Douglas wrote for a different audience not for scholars and law reviews, but for the people. Now, interestingly today, we know that the court is full of environmental cases or at least cert petitions relating to environmental cases. But surprisingly, the word environmental, as we now use it, only came to the Supreme Court for the first time in 1970. And then of course it surfaced again in what was Douglas's most famous environmental case, Sierra Club v. Morton. In this particular case, this involves Mineral King Valley, which is in California. It's a 12 mile glacial valley. And the Forest Service announced that it had approved Walt Disney Corporation Productions plan to put a $35 million resort into Mineral King Valley. And now you can see a picture of what that resort would have looked like. There was fierce opposition and then the Sierra Club stepped in to try to stop it. And the strategy worked at first. The district court temporarily halted the resort. The government quickly appealed and they won in the Ninth Circuit, something that we'll then see what happens. Next stop, Supreme Court. Now, interestingly, as we've talked about his hikes and his work with the Sierra Club, Douglas was no stranger. He had been on the board of Sierra Club in the 1960s, and then later he was made a life member. He didn't disclaim that membership until 1970. And here we see he wrote to the Sierra Club saying, I don't want to be disqualified in cases that come before the court. And then he said, I'm not thinking of any case in particular. I have not seen one here, nor have I heard of one which is on the way. Well, in my view, that is disingenuous. This is December 1970, because when he wrote that, the petition had been pending for more than a month, and there was enormous publicity around the Ninth Circuit decision, around the development, and Douglas was the court, the circuit court justice for the Ninth Circuit. There was also gossip around the court about would he recuse because not only did we have the case of his membership and work with the Sierra Club, but just that year and in earlier years, like the Red River Gorge, he'd worked very closely with the Sierra Club. Douglas seemed to focus only on the question that the Sierra Club was a party and he was not a member of the Sierra Club anymore, but he didn't really consider the appearance issue. 
Later, he acknowledged that being a director of the Sierra Club made him realize that his view on environmental policy matters really didn't jibe with those of others. They really were more consonant with John Muir and as he put it, Clarence Darrow. So the reality of um, was that, you know, this case was really made for Douglas. It had all the elements of uh, collage and had Walt well, Disney Corporation and it had environmental issues. So it also was the very first time the Sierra Club was a party in the court as opposed to amicus or otherwise. And the big question was, did the Sierra Club have standing to bring the case? Well, normally you would think they would, but they didn't allege injury to the Sierra Club. Instead, they said the injury was to Mineral King's environment, not to a member of the Sierra Club. So the Supreme Court agreed with the Ninth Circuit, which we often like when they agree with us, and um, the Ninth Circuit had dismissed the suit. Justice Stewart wrote for the majority, 4-3, and he said that the Sierra Club didn't have standing because there was no allegation about the club itself. And really, in some ways, this was a case more about pleading than anything else, because he said in a, a footnote um, that nothing would prevent the Sierra Club from going back and amending its complaint. So, of course, it pays to read the footnotes. Douglas then penned a passionate dissent, and it was a rallying cry for opening the courts to protect nature. And here you can see his dissent. He talked about the inanimate object, that's Mineral King. He talked about valley, alpine, meadows, rivers, and lakes. And what he was saying is the case should have been called Mineral King versus Morton, the Secretary of the Interior, because the Mineral King should have been the plaintiff. Now it's interesting because the constitutional theory underlying this notion actually can be traced to a law review article in the Southern California Law Review by Professor Christopher Stone. So how did it find its way into Douglas's drafts starting right after the case was heard? Well, the answer is through intersection of serendipity and calculation. It's an answer I reached through interviews with law review articles, um, authors, the law clerks, and the Supreme Court files. And I was able to line all of this up for the first time side by side and see, because normally we wouldn't be looking inside the files of the Supreme Court and then putting those with correspondence and other documents. So here's the serendipity. The year before, Douglas had been asked to write an introduction to a USC law review on technology. And not long afterwards, Stone had hit on this idea of do trees have standing? His students apparently laughed at him, but he thought it was kind of interesting. So he went to the library at USC and said, is there any kind of case that I could use this in? And the very astute librarian said, yes. Sierra Club v. Morton, which at the time had gone from the Ninth Circuit to the Supreme Court. So he quickly started drafting his article, but he wondered how would he get it to the court, particularly Justice Douglas, who would be most sympathetic. So that was the serendipity, and now we have the fate. One of his former students was clerking for Douglas. And later the clerk said he was the culprit because a synopsis and eventually the entire draft was given to Douglas before the law review article actually came out. In his normal pattern, Douglas actually drafted his dissent the day of the argument. It took him about two hours and it bore more than an uncanny resemblance to that Stone article. Now enter Judge Alsa who was also clerking for Douglas that term, but he was not the clerk from USC. He was, however, the clerk assigned to the case. And after he saw that initial draft of the dissent, here's what Judge Alsop had to say. He said, it was the most beautiful thing I had ever read. 
So what the justice then said is, okay, here's my draft. You go figure out the footnotes. In effect, put them in backwards and support what I said. So the dissent was vintage Douglas. He waxed eloquent about nature. Uh, he talked about uh, an unorthodox solution and he excoriated federal agencies. So Judge also had his work cut out for him to go and find footnotes that would fit all of these propositions. So now we often think the phrase, should trees have standing is a Justice Douglas phrase, but in fact, it started with Professor Stone. Now in the wake of the court's ruling, the, the Sierra Club took the hint, they went back and they amended, but ultimately the project died. There were environmental reviews, there were money problems. And interestingly, by then Walt Disney had also died and he too had been a life member of the Sierra Club. So now we're in a situation where it's 1972 and Justice Douglas is winding down. As he entered his fourth decade on the court, he was a seasoned justice, but he also was plagued with impeachment and poor health. One might imagine that he would have become a real beacon or player in the environmental arena because these cases really started to come to the court and he had such a passion, but he never exercised a strategic effort to gain allies. By now he was a little less wedded to precedent and he made a stunning statement. He said, I'm ready to bend the law in favor of the environment and against corporations. That was recorded in a biography called Wild Bill by Professor Murphy. But 10 years later, the law professor to whom that statement supposedly came from, he actually denied it. So we'll never know because the professor and Justice Douglas, of course, are now both deceased. So Douglas did what he did best throughout his career. He highlighted the need for transparency in government. And he also knew the folly of giving blind deference to administrative agencies. So just as he had on the hikes and in Congress, his dissenting opinions, and many of them were dissent for failure to take or accept certiorari of a case, he had a reverence for the word sanctuary. And he spent a lifetime dissenting on the road, dissenting in the political world, and dissenting on the court but he stayed true to his principles. And it's fitting that his last opinion before retirement was an environmental one, although not significant. He didn't want to leave the court, but his body told him otherwise. He died five years after leaving the court in 1975. But to the end, he was an advocate. And he was working with Senator Jackson in Washington State and his aide on the boundaries for a wilderness area in Washington for which he had lobbied since the late 1950s. And ultimately it was called the William O. Douglas Wilderness. And you can see here as if you were standing in the William O. Douglas Wilderness, you would be looking at Mount Rainier, which he could see along with Adams from his steps in Yakima growing up. To bring this to a close, I ask, well, what are the lessons we learn from Douglas and what is his legacy? Well, the first one is that heroes aren't perfect. By all accounts, he was a bit of a difficult personality and according to some law clerks, a very impossible boss. Once when he thought a clerk had written in a book, he threw it out the window. Clerks were routinely fired and then they showed up the next day as if nothing happened. But even so, many of his clerks, including Judge Alsup, recall fondly his storytelling over a glass of scotch or joining him on the CNO Canal and being in his amazing presence. And he also treated those in the conservation movement with respect and affection. His warm and caring letters to the Muries are examples of that. And here we see a picture of him with his wife, Kathy, at Goose Prairie. 
Much was made of the four marriages. But then I think of the famous Mexican artist, Diego Rivera, he had four wives. And no one ever said he wasn't a great painter. Kathy remembers him as enormously charming, funny, adventurous, and also relishing the joy of life. He was definitely a complicated individual, but he was brilliant and filled with demons and on a mission. He once counseled a clerk, get out into the stream of history and swim as fast as you can. In my view, Douglas surely took his own advice. So finally, I think the second lesson we can learn is that his notion of a citizen justice does not fit comfortably with judicial ethics. He imagined he could be a citizen justice so long as it didn't interfere with the work on the court. And we now know the current court is intimately involved in our lives in everything from climate change to environmental issues relating to the border wall to federal preemption of state pollution laws and more. And although there was no federal ethics code at the time Douglas was there, and nor is there one today, the current justices do follow the federal ethics code. And of course, there was always the oath that justices took to be fair and impartial. Modern ethics norms, social media, Freedom of Information Act, and agency transparency would make his advocacy all but impossible today. And I can't imagine that any justice today would informally run for president from his seat on the bench. His most lasting legacy, of course, was to the natural world, his legacy to conservation. His life spanned the growth of the conservation movement post-World War II and later passage of really the most significant environmental legislation, the Wilderness Act, NEPA, Clean Water and Clean Air Acts. And there's little doubt that Douglas's commitment and connection to land had an enormous impact on our landscape today. And importantly, also on our conversation about the environment. He was like a climate canary. He sounded early warning signals about environmental hazards and an acute ecological crisis. For him, preservation was not at odds with progress. The day he gave his retirement letter, he wrote a note to his colleagues and he reflected on the path that they had followed together. He analogized his time on the court to a canoe trip in the wilderness, where at the start of the trip, the justices were strangers. But at the end, they were warm and fast friends. In his letter, he said he hoped the justices would leave these wilderness watercourses as pure and unpolluted as we left those that we traversed. So what did he want his legacy to be? He simply said he hoped to be remembered as someone who made the earth more beautiful than when he came. And he did. We cannot forget what he did for the CNO Canal, nor will the 5 million visitors who go there each year now, or the Allagash River in Maine, the Red River in Arkansas, Glacier Peak in Washington, stopping the Kennecott Copper Mine, a pond in New Jersey, a river in Oregon, the Big Thicket in Texas, the sage in Wyoming, the peaceful Arctic in Alaska, the beach on the Pacific coast, and the list goes on and on and on. And of course, the trees and mineral king are still standing. Thank you for letting me share with you the story of Justice Douglas, his life as a citizen justice, and his life as an environmental advocate. And thank you so much, Judge McCune. Um, we have just a few moments for questions here, and I will share them. I wish we had more time because we've had a number of questions. That was an amazingly mesmerizing,
presentation and mostly people are anxious to read the whole book. But um, appropriately enough, several of our questions have focused on an area which you're very familiar with, which is judicial ethics. And a number of people had asked whether Justice Douglas had been asked to recuse himself at any point and whether he had taken a position on that. And similarly, there were a couple of questions. Um, we believe that you mentioned something about an impeachment and whether um, Justice Douglas, what the, what, if we could get some more information about the efforts to impeach. Um, on the ethics, um, I, I don't have any uh, documentation of a motion to recuse him from any cases. There was, as I said, a lot of gossip, a lot of scuttlebutt, but not a formal motion to recuse. And then there was, of course, talk around the court. And some felt that, at least in the Sierra Club case, that he should have recused. But he didn't recuse in the cases involving the Army Corps of Engineers or Udall or others. Um, and others in later years said, well, is it like Justice Scalia and duck hunting? So I'll leave you to draw your <laughs> conclusions. On impeachment, the purported reason for his impeachment had to do with monies he had received from a private foundation called the Parvin Foundation. And it was a foundation that did a number of very positive, what I would call civic and good government undertakings. But um, the person who led that charge was Congressman Gerald Ford. And ironically, when Justice Douglas retired, the president was then President Gerald Ford. These environmental questions came up only in the background of that impeachment because that was really not the focus. But he was asked by his attorneys, detail um, everywhere you've written letters or appeared or hiked or whatever. And he actually provided a very handy list, not complete, but quite a handy list for me to go from in my research. Well, thank you so much. I wish we had time to have more questions. And I can only hope that once your book is published next year, we'll be able to invite you back to share more stories with us because we could easily listen to another hour of this. And I know that it's very hard to speak and also uh, look at the chat box at the same time. But if you had been able to, like I would, you would have seen that throughout the entire presentation, people have been expressing their gratitude to you about what an enlightening and charming and wonderful presentation this Beth has been. So on behalf of both of our societies, the Northern District Historical Society and the Ninth Judicial Circuit Historical Society, um, we'd like to thank you so much for your time and effort today. Um, on behalf of everyone, thank you so much. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with our societies, we would love to have you be members. This is uh, one of many programs that we do um, and certainly one of the best uh, so you're getting a great sense of what our society does. So we are listing in the chat box the links to both of our websites. We would love for you to stop by our website to see more about us, become members of the society, and support all of our efforts, which are generally education about the vibrant legal history of the West, as Judge McEwen's uh, very wonderful presentation today so ably demonstrates and also about more generally about the importance of an independent judiciary. So come see more programs, support our mission, see our oral histories. We'd love to have you be a part of all of that. Um, and on behalf of both of our societies, I would like to once again thank um, Judge Alsop for his lovely introduction, Judge McEwen for her amazing presentation, and Scarlett Espinoza, our incredibly able staff person for making all of this so seamless. And with that, uh, I'd like to say thank you and good evening.